thanks, uh, thanks, Bobby, for your introduction. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. So I'm going to talk about replacing copper with linear optics uh, in this talk. So the first thing, just as a very basic fundamental thing that all of you know, but we, we all need, need to remember every time we talk about this, is that processes don't work at 10 gigabits even. Processes work at hundreds of mega, megahertz inside or a few gigahertz clock rates. So, uh, and whenever we communicate to the outside, there's always an I.O. macro associated with that that multiplexes up. So there's always some sort of a parallel to serial conversion going on, call it CERDES. And uh, the amount of multiplexing up is driven by how much complexity, power, processing, real estate you want to expend on the die to do that function versus packaging complexity. How many bumps, what's your bump spacing? How, how much room do you have to get those signals out of the die? So that's the trade-off that happens on the die level. And then you have a similar trade-off on the transmission medium side in terms of lane density and distance. What, what do you want to do with that signal? How, how far do you want to go? And um, what's the complexity of the transmission scheme? So all of this determines um, how high you multiplex up. And here are three examples for multiplexing. Um, HBM3, UCIE, and CERDES going to 6, 32, and 200 gig, respectively. And um, you can see all these trade-offs between the bump pitch, uh, I.O. density, power consumption, and so on. One very important thing is the distance column. That's how far can you go. And as you, as you can see, the only technology that allows you to go su substantial reaches out of the package, across a PCB, or even across a copper cable for one meter at 200G, that's high-speed CERDES. That's the only technology that really universally allows you to go um, uh, out, of, out of the package. Now, it's, uh, for that reason, high-speed CERDES has become sort of the universal interface. So you, you use high-speed CERDES anyway because you don't know ahead of time what you're going to connect to that uh, package. So that's why high-speed CERDES are so prevalent inside the chip and are so powerful. And the digital, and digital processing has really made them powerful over the la last couple generations. So, so powerful that they can actually directly drive high-speed optics. That's very important. Um, but they can only do that well if you make your optics look like copper to the CERDES, because the CERDES was designed to drive copper. So if you make your optics look like copper to the CERDES, then the CERDES has no problem driving optics. And you extend your reach from 30 centimeters on a PCB or one meter uh, twin X cable, all of a sudden hundreds of meters uh, through fiber. Um, obviously, you don't have to put that, uh, those I.O. macros directly inside the die which is becoming an issue as they grow bigger in size. So what people are doing is they put chiplets uh, um, next to, to the processor die, where the processor then communicates, say, UCIE or some other uh, wide and parallel die-to-die -die interface to, a, to an interfacing chip. Um, and that converts then to CERDES. But the CERDES block is still the same. The CERDES macro is the same. And that entire solution is roughly the same power. So both, uh, both of them use high-speed CERDES, um, and both of them are about the same power. So now, what does it mean to make optics look like copper? So um, a copper channel is very linear, so no, no distortions of any nonlinear sorts. You have uh, pulse broadening, you have echoes, reflections, but all of that is, is linear and can, uh, can be undone using linear signal processing. So, Nonlinear distortions come in terms of amplitude distortions, so your eyes in a PAM4 have different uh, openings, or they come in terms of time skews, so your, your optimal timing point is no longer at one specific point, which is problematic for CERDES to handle in optics. So what you do is um, you build your linear optics, like shown here. That's a very, a lin very linear eye that we, we built. We measured at uh, 106.25 gig, and if you Build your optics like that, and any any optic any uh, any uh, copper CERDES can handle it uh, very well. Now, um, another very important point when we talk about all these things is is networking. So um, we don't want just point-to-point -point big fat pipes. That 
do you no good in a, in a real system, in an AI cluster, for example. You want a very high fan out. You want to break out. Every GPU wants to talk to every other GPU. So that's why it's uh, this high radix, high fan out is, is extremely important. And for that reason, you better, you're much better off with single wavelength interfaces. Because everything you do WDM, you have to first WDM demultiplex to then fiber shuffle to then WDM remultiplex to send on to your next node. And that, uh, that uh, method of demultiplexing, shuffling, and remultiplexing costs you a lot of loss. And that loss costs, uh, costs you power in the laser, because you need to ha have the laser run hotter uh, to accommodate for that loss. So that's one aspect why uh, single wavelength is the way to go for these high fan out um, uh, architectures. Another very important aspect is you need to observe the currency of the data center, the currency of the AI cluster. You need to trade in a currency that's understood by the AI cluster, which is Ethernet, InfiniBand, NVLink, PCIe CXL. That's the, the currency of clusters. If you do some proprietary anything, then it just doesn't work in a, in a cluster unless you design the entire cluster uh, by yourself. So that's two very important things related to networking uh, in these things. Okay, so now we know that um, high-speed optics are great because SERDIS can directly drive it. So how about these slow optics? There, is this, there are many talks about uh, building wide and parallel optics. The issue here is that slow IOs like UCIE cannot directly drive slow optics. You need some sort of a gearbox, a retimer, a reconditioner, some sort of functionality, call it SERDIS in between. So you just shift your SERDIS from one place to the other. Um, so that's, that's something you absolutely need. And um, also the uh, slow optical IOs need much more, many more optical components because now you have many more modulators. The modulator goes by lane. So um, if you modulate at, say, just for, for example's sake, at 10 gig, you need 10 times as many modulators as if you operate at 100 gig. And that's yield, that's complexity, uh, so that's not something that's nice um, to implement in optics. And also, these slow optical IOs very poorly amortize the overheads on each lane. What's an overhead? Overhead could be the modulator bias control. Don't underestimate the power that that takes. And, uh, and a modulator bias control is the same, whether it's for 10 gig or 100 gig. So the more, bit, the bit more bits you, you send through a modulator, the better you amortize that overhead. Another overhead is the cost of fiber. So you, um, you want to send at least a couple hundred gigabit through a fiber in order to make the cost of the fiber not appear in your bomb, really. Because the cost of a fiber is essentially the cost of the two connection endpoints, which is a dollar. So it's two dollars per fiber. The, the fiber itself doesn't cost anything. So, uh, and two dollars divided by 10 gig is a different cost per bit than two dollars divided by 200 gig. So you want to amortize that fiber. If you can't amortize it through a single lane, you have to multiplex, you have to WDM. That's why the low speed optics always WDM, because they need to amortize the fiber. And that's, uh, that's a very costly proposition in terms of complexity and, again, power consumption. So what we're doing at Nubis is we build these um, engines that are shown here. These engines are, um, you have these silicon photonics dyes here, these light gray uh, slab, which is very, very small. It's like six by eight millimeters. Extremely small, and it houses it houses 16 modulators at 100 gig, and also 16 photodetectors that detect the signal. On top of that silicon photonics die, we have driver and TIAs, driver amplifiers, an eight-lane driver here, another eight-lane driver in the back, eight-lane TIA here, another eight-lane TIA there. So a total of 16 channels transmit and 16 channels receive. And then we escape the fiber in the third dimension. We go uh, right up um, using a two-dimensional fiber array. In this case, a three by 12 fiber array. So that's 16 fibers for transmit, 16 fibers for receive, and four fibers to feed ex external laser light into the module. Um, by the way, this disaggregation of the laser is a good thi thing 
because you can put the laser in thermally nice places and in serviceable places, which many customers really appreciate. What you can also do is, once you have that uh, three-dimensional escape, you can start tiling your optical chips or modules um, in a 2D tiled pattern. And that gives you huge uh, amounts of scalability in terms of edge bandwidth density, but also in terms of area density. And so you, and th th the power of that digital service is then that it can drive all the way down here because it can accommodate quite some loss. And I'll show you some data uh, in a second. And of course, you could also put this array on the bottom of a chip if you wanted to, uh, to escape down. Uh, you don't have to escape through the edge. That's, you can escape through the area in this architecture, no problem. This is um, how we package uh, these modules. So I have one here. This actually works. So we, we sample them to customer, we, we produce them. So you can, uh, you can just contact us, we'll give you these modules uh, with an EVB. So uh, that's a full 1.6 terabit, full duplex engine, 16 by 100 gig transmit, 16 by 100 gig receive. You can tile it in a two-dimensional array like this to get 10 terabit full duplex on the footprint of half a business card. That's the density you can achieve. And here is an, a use case example. Um, where you have some uh, accelerator here, you have eight, uh, five of our modules for a total of eight terabits per second. Here you have the lasers. The lasers could also be completely somewhere else um, in the system, but uh, this particular customer wanted them on the board. And here you escape your optical signals through the front panel of that PCIe card. Now here is just a summary of what's uh, important in, um, in those high density uh, optical IOs for AI, AI clusters. You want a high density, so terabits per second per millimeter. You want low latency, which in our case we do because there is just an electrical amplifier that drives a modulator and on the receive side it's a photodiode that feeds into a TIA. So there is no notion of a clock, no notion of a retiming going on. So you have much less than a nanosecond. Uh, in fact, the chip itself just has like 112, I think 120 picoseconds of, of delay. You want low power, so less than six picojoules per bit, including the laser and control and including everything. And that's what we achieve. You want to go from short distances up to hundreds of meters. Um, in our case, we demonstrate up to 10 kilometers, which for some mobile front hall applications you want, because you can also think of this as being on top of a radio head in a mobile uh, scenario. Um, you want full radix networking that dictates your single wavelength approach, and you want to use the currency of the data center, which, is, uh, which gives you the full network capability that you need to interconnect clusters. And just to show you some performance measurements, because this is not just PowerPoint slideware, this is actual hardware that exists, and we'll ha be happy to give it to you. These are the measured uh, 16 transmit eyes, uh, all running simultaneously um, at uh, 106.25 gigabits per second ethernet rate. You see here the extinction ratio at two different case temperatures, well above the ethernet spec. The TDEQ of all 16 channels running simultaneously at two different uh, case temperatures, all well below the DR4 spec. You see here the loopback performance um, of our transmitters speaking to our receivers, getting 10 minus 8 error rates and lower um, at, at all across temperatures, well within the DR4 limit, all linearly driven by, um, by a medium reach 30s over 12 dB of loss, so 12 dB from the 30s to the transmitter and 12 dB from the transmitter to the 30s in this particular case. You see very short FEC tails, so only one uh, T count, maybe sometimes two or three, but um, that's all because of the linearity we, uh, we achieve that. And here you see a typical use case, so that's how we characterize the system. We have 30s, we, we've tested this with many different 30s uh, from all kinds of um, companies and from all kinds of uh, classes like MR, VSR, MR, LR 30s. Um, and then we have an electrical trace that we vary typically, the, the loss at Nyquist. Then we have our module, we feed it through fiber. It says up to two kilometers, you can go a little longer than that too. And, uh, and then you, uh, and shorter of course as well. And, and then we have the same loss back to the, to the receive 30s. And here what we show is the prefect error rate as a function of the electrical trace loss for two different 30s vendors. 
One is an MR, the other is an LR, and you see that we can comfortably go up to 25 dB of trace loss each way, 25 here and 25 plus 25 here at a 10 minus 6 error rate and still have margin to, uh, to the FEC limit. Here is one example what that looks like. We had that running at, at OFC the whole week without any glitches, um, with all channels running. Here is another here is another um, uh, demonstration we had running at last design con with, uh, on PCIe Gen 6 with an alpha wave uh, 30s and we went all the way to 10 minus 12 error rate. You only see one of the VR uh, uh, traces here, but obviously we had many channels running and that's what it looks like. If you, if you want to order one and get it in your lab, that's, uh, that's what you'll get. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Peter. Uh, if you have a questions, uh, please step up to the microphone. Hello, I had a question about. Mm. Oh. Yep. So I had a question about your um, 16 by 100 gig. Is the that's single mode coupling through like a grading coupler on? Yes. Yeah, it's it's a single mode fiber coupled in through a grading coupler, a array, a 2D array of grading couplers. Yes. So my question is, um, if it, if it's 16 channels, what's the expandability to be like? You know. 128 or whatever. Yeah, so excellent question. So from a pick point of view, there is no limit because, uh, I mean, we just repeat Lego block wise. Uh, we repeat the grating coupler array. The real issue is how big a matrix of fibers can you make? Right. And there are, uh, there are applications where you have thousand or more fibers in a two dimensional array. People use that for wavelength selective switches in long haul, uh, in long haul uh, WSSs, right? So this technology exists to build thousand fiber 2D matrices. So the scalability is enormous and we haven't even talked about multi-core yet. This this extends 100% to multi-core fiber right out of the gate. And not just the multi-core fiber that has the four cores in one row. It's a true multi-core fiber with hexagonal uh, core patterns. So scalability is enormous here. So I've just the question is if across thermal does you get like different yield loss ah. because you have a very larger array. So there's another very good thing about uh, about this from thermal because what you have with edge coupling is you have warpage of the of the pick. So it's very hard to couple a, a long 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 linear array into a flat structure into a pick. Here we use the area and the distances are not that great. So thermal we see no no problem, no effects of thermal uh, from the coupling. Cool, thanks. Mm -hmm. Another question? Yes. Uh, I'm not sure whether you are okay to disclose whether you are using an external laser source or built-in laser source. Yeah, no, no, I, I mentioned before, uh, happy to disclose. We are, we are using external laser sources, which are coupled in through four fibers. So we do a one by four split um, uh, of each uh, uh, laser fiber to four modulators, and we use external laser sources, yes. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. I have a question. So when you coupling the lights, you know, from at, at the top surface, right? Would that blocking your uh, thermal, uh, you know, to uh, to reduce the thermals on, on on top? Because I didn't, you know, I, I see it's a flat top, so I didn't know if you have any heat sinks or anything. Yes. So the heat sink that we have actually goes around. You s you see it here. Um, if I hold it up like this, so the heat sink goes around the fiber array. So uh, the fiber array itself doesn't dissipate any heat. So um, it, it's not critical to cool right here. You, what you want to cool is those chips here, those four chips. So our, our lid and heat sink attaches right there, and that's where the heat goes out. Any other questions? Uh, thank you, Peter. Thank you.